All right. Um, the talk is, I guess there's kind of a couple of titles floating around, and I gave this talk about a month ago at the Code Camp, so I've got a bunch of titles for it, so forgive me. And I've kind of been evolving the content, so it does actually say Ice Coffee Scrub and Tame JS, but uh, I actually have something cooler I found in the process, uh, which is, I guess, one of the fun things about putting a presentation like this together. So, uh, there's contact information, but it's also on the meetup site, so. Uh, first thing I just want to say is this is a really subjective talk for me. Uh, I've done some technical stuff in the past, but I think one of the cool things that I've enjoyed about doing this is it's opinionated. Uh, I'm going to bring some of my ideas to the table, and you might have other ideas. Uh, but keep that in mind that I'll talk at times as if I know, like I'm kind of dictating how to do it. I hope I don't come across that way. Um, and I hope that you take away from this maybe some ideas for how you may apply these things in your own scenarios. Um, I'm going to go over a bunch of samples today, and before I do that, I just wanted to point out, and maybe that's, yeah, sure. Oh, it's supposed to have maybe touch it. I want to point out a sample, I hope that's big enough. Um, if not, I'll zoom it. Uh, I want to point out a sample of the flow of what the uh, examples will follow and the output, just so you guys have an idea. Um, I'm coming at this from a pretty asynchronous serial process. And I'll talk a little bit about where I think this fits in. But I think this is a great example of how um, the asynchronous nature of working with JavaScript, um, when you start looking uh, maybe more in, uh, well, in serial workflows, but maybe I would refer, hate to refer to it as the enterprise or business world, but where we're doing a set of tasks and we're retrieving resources and composing something to uh, send off to another system or send to somebody, um, the, the composition of that can get kind of ugly uh, without some help. Okay, so the scenario is that we're going to grab an order, say a customer has requested the status, uh, going to get their email address and the tracking information for it, and we're going to send them an email with the status. Um, it's pretty trivial, and the email looks something like that. So I contrived this, though, so that we have a couple of things going on. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right, maybe I'll get closer to the same. Um, first off, we have to get a first piece of information to then get two other pieces of information that don't depend on each other, so we can look at um, some parallel concerns there. And then we have to wait for both of those to complete before we can do the last step. So it's kind of a, a couple different scenarios going on here. We have a series and a parallel portion. Um, the first thing I want to go over is probably how we're all familiar with it when we uh, have been working with JavaScript um, without maybe delving a lot into client side um, development yet. Is that okay? Oh, well, don't need to see all of it. Um, without any help and without any applying any patterns, this is probably what the code looks like when we first begin doing something like this. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of things that don't look pretty about it. Um, the things I notice and what started to bother me about this, especially when I moved to the server side and started using Node to do more line of business stuff was, uh, this became a lot of work. Um, I'm used to using uh, languages that uh, synchronous languages, you know, we're all used to using them where they don't require this overhead of error handling and they don't require a lot of uh, marching to the right to get stuff done. Um, the first thing, yeah, so the first thing I noticed and drove me crazy was copying and pasting error handling code all over the place. So I could either choose, like some people do, not to handle errors and assume they never happen, or I can go ahead and try and cover myself, but at, at that time, then I'm like copying and pasting this ceremonial chunk of code that isn't even consistent with how other people do it all the time. So, And in this example, I'll just throw exceptions because I'm running in a test framework. So if we run any of this, it's okay to throw exceptions. But in reality, you wouldn't even want to do that. So sometimes um, that line can look even uglier. Oops. OK, the next thing uh, I think you would notice, and every time I've gone to prepare for this talk or work on this talk, is I go to this first, I'm like, OK, let's look at the first example because it's the most basic. But then I look at it, I'm like, what does this do again? <laughs> so I think it was nice to kind of put the scenario together so you guys saw that because just looking at this, I don't think anybody's going to just pick up on what exactly is going on right away. There's so much noise. I um, mean, it's, it's hard uh, without seeing things lined up to understand that this is a pretty serial process. Um, so the next thing I notice is that just readability is not there. Um, it's not very refactorable either. So that's the next concern in my mind is um, a lot of times I'll work on an initial pass of code and I'll just get it working. And I'm going to want to come back to it later, maybe a couple of weeks or months later, uh, when a duplication arises. And I may want to try and remove some of that duplication. And it gets pretty tricky to 
yank out a portion of this and try and move it somewhere else because the parts you would want to move might be something like connecting to the database. Um, and that's enclosing the entire scope of everything. So that becomes very difficult to remove this piece without affecting almost every line of code in this file. Um, may, may take some of the pieces like tracking information and move it somewhere. Um, and you can see like things you may want to move are typically on the outermost scope and then that becomes very difficult to separate. So refactoring is just not there in my opinion. Um, we're dealing with an asynchronous language and uh, server platform and so one of the wonderful things is the ability to have easy parallelism and without some type of help though, it's not going to be really possible here. I mean, you could write some, uh, you could put some state in to track what's completed and try and write a bunch of uh, code to run things in parallel. And you could do that, it just wouldn't look pretty. That would lead out to basically what you're doing when that's more of a separate concern. And uh, along with parallelism, there's really no ability uh, without some type of help to control that degree of parallelism. And, and, I, and I put these in because they'll come up later on too. But, uh, and also to control even, not necessarily working on a set of operations and controlling how many of them are running at a time, but maybe you have a bunch of parallel things to run and you only want to run two or three of those and then run the next two or three. So controlling individual tasks themselves. So that's kind of the state of where people begin. Um, and I kind of want to walk through those same criteria that I kind of wrote down, and uh, some more that will come up along the way. And I kind of like scored all these criteria, and the reason that all the screens were red was because those were all the problems I found with the default way of doing things. Um, in the talk, though, I used just three criteria. There will be good if I like it, and it's like my opinion. Uh, it's not the right way. <laughs> uh, so good is a relative term. Uh, caution means it's probably good in my mind, but there's a few, you, there's some limits to how good it is, and you want to only apply it in certain cases, kind of. And then lastly, the bad, things we just, I, I'm sorry, things I just don't like. And not to offend anybody if anybody likes code like that, so there's nothing probably wrong with it. Perhaps it's just my secret of mine. And uh, if I had started out with this, maybe I would, maybe I would hate the other way. So uh, the first thing I want to, I'm going to kind of reverse this talk. It's, I wanted to touch on, and I'm getting to ICE and things like it, but I wanted to build up to that and kind of walk through the criteria and why I moved in that direction. So this is kind of like my personal journey of looking, uh, looking for solutions. So once this started happening a lot, uh, because I was doing more and more of these things on the server, and I'm kind of like, well, it's time to start looking. So the first place I looked for was the community. What is the community doing? Because this certainly can't just be a problem I have. And uh, I think one of the biggest packages in the community is async. So I don't know how many people have used the async package. OK, a couple of people at least. OK, so it's pretty popular. There's a ton of these. Uh, I'm going to go over this one. I actually do have my criteria evaluated for a few more if you're interested in that. But for, for time's sake, I will oops, let me go to this one. Um, let's go ahead and pull that up. And um, next thing I guess, I hope everybody can at least understand coffee short enough to understand this talk because I wanted to clean this up a little bit. Um, if anybody has a problem, let me know though, and I'll compile this down to JavaScript and can look at it that way. So. Um, okay, so async module. All I have to do is include it. And we can take the same chunk of code, and I'm not gonna show the breadth of the async module, but basically we can use a waterfall which is just a serial set of tasks that will complete one after the other to step through this process and uh, pass data from one step to the next. Um, and I've broken out the code now, and I also wanted to say this is my personal opinion. I, uh, when I'm working with the async module, I like to break out the code. Uh, some people will just inline it here, since it's just an array, you could just have each function just inline there. I like to break them out because I can name them and avoid commenting, and uh, I can also get a little more readability because I can look down the bottom of the file or the top wherever I put it and see the series of tasks that are being executed. Um, which is a good pattern actually, you know, lends itself to a, a good way of organizing because when these individual pieces become messy. Uh, so we basically just connect to the database, that's broken up to a function. The async module you uh, you write basically the code that'll look exactly like you're used to working with, taking a callback upon completion, executing the callback. Um, so that's nice. Uh, we look up the order, 
grab the order. When this is complete, then it will pass it to the query email details, which is then going to query those two uh, pieces of information that are separate. We can go ahead and grab the user and the tracking information. And in the async module, there is a parallel uh, method that allows you to run tasks in parallel. And then on completion, uh, we'll pass both of the pass the results into kind of the result object. So then I compose the email down here. I can take those details that I queried, grab the user, grab the tracking information, and compose my email and send it. Um, one of the first nice things in the green thing here. Oh, um, that's maybe that's a little hard. No, you can see that. Okay. Uh, is that it has a has fall through error handling. So I don't have to write copy and paste that error handling code all over the place. So that's one nice thing, and that's one thing I like about it. Um, I, I think it's a lot more readable, just because it's not so nested. You can see that there's a series of tasks being completed here, and you know if you choose to organize and name them as such, it becomes really easy to understand what they're doing. But um, and the reason I the reason I la labeled this yellow is because I feel I still feel like the callback abstraction is bleeding out into what otherwise could be simpler code. Oops, that's in the wrong error button. Forgive me, I first time I've used uh, I think reveal JS. If anybody wants a presentation tool, it's pretty awesome. Um, refactoring was the next area, um, and one thing I like about this particular tool and using it is it encourages you to write methods that are easy to share. Uh, because they're using a callback type style of node anyways. It's a style that almost every application and um, every package uses at module boundaries. So it's easy to grab a piece like connected to the database and I can stick that in another file and just reference that file it's, or reference that live module or library as desired. Um, it comes with, as we saw here, the ability to run tasks in parallel. So that's fantastic. And it actually has um, advanced capabilities to control the degree of parallelism. So when you're running, in, like, say you had 100 things you needed to go look up, you could actually say run ten, only 10 at a time. So you wouldn't just beat up your remote resource or local or whatever. Okay. And uh, on an individual basis, and you can see that here actually demonstrated in this sample, um, you can actually control the degree of parallelism. The reason I put it as a yellow and not as it may be a green is because uh, if you wanted to say, say you had four tasks and you were running them all in parallel, for some reason you could only run two, um, and there are distinct tasks, um, you either have to stick them into an array and then do map limit on that, um, or uh, you could, you'd have to break them, maybe take two of them, run them in one step, and then separate out another step and run the other two. So there's a little extra work in that regard. But it's, it's still got great. Uh, Still, and I'm not trying to bash it by any means. Great parallelism, I mean. and maybe parallelism isn't a word. I don't know. Every time I say that, it sounds weird. Uh, the only problem I really have with the async module is that it introduces a new problem. Um, I'm trying to solve the problem of marching off the screen. We now have uh, pseudo global variable scope to be able to pass things forward more than one step. So I can take something I can query. I can open the database connection in the first step. Um, that database reference and is only ref is only passed the second step. If I want to use it in subsequent steps, I'll have to do some magic or create a global variable to get it there. And you can see that in this example, I actually close the database after we get all the information out of it. So that's one case where we're passing it forward a few steps. Um, let's see, I think order. Yeah, order is the other one. So order, I get. Um, and I need, to use, I need to use that to query the email details, but I also need to use it to compose the email. So I have to create another goal for that. Um, so a, maybe some people don't find that to be a problem, but it really bugs me. Um, it also impacts the refactorability, too. If you start thinking those pieces up where data shared between steps, it could be very confusing what needs to go with it. Um, and of course, so the next uh, area you may see people branching out into, and we saw the talk on this the last time, and I just wanted to give the example again. Um, was is promises. So it's another way to look at a problem. Um, we covered this. Uh, how many people were here the last time? A couple people shy or just turn over. No. <laughs> uh, okay, so I've kind of rewrote the same sample, looking at. Uh, promises and just my analysis of that because that was kind of my next step was well I've used promises a little bit on the client side with jQuery maybe we can use this to kind of structure these problems um, it's going to look a lot of like the last 
solution. I broke things out into steps, now that's my personal preference. You could inline them. Um, it may not even look that bad. Now that you're not dealing with an array and you're dealing with chain function calls, it might, might look a little bit better. Um, if anybody looks at this, you'll see I massively refactored this since like a couple of hours ago because I had had this separated out so that down here at the bottom were all the uh, promiseify methods where you wrap a basically like a node-like method and turn it into a promise-like method, more or less. Uh, I actually moved that back into the code because I, I was kind of like, well, you know, I, in all the other solutions I have later on, I let those solutions bleed throughout the problem. Why not let this, uh, why not let this, uh, maybe not bleed, but permeate the whole problem and see how it can actually uh, become a first-class part of the solution that you're using. So you'll see that in each of these methods, I'm wrapping up um, methods that are and other modules that are following typical node format with a callback at the end. And I'm building up promises. Um, I only, I don't want to walk through the code a lot because there was the last talk and people may be familiar with it, but um, it's got great error handling again. We have fallback or fall through error handling. Uh, we can actually compose that pretty easily at any step in the process. Uh, we, can, we can terminate if there's a problem. We, and I think there's a little more flexibility even than with using the async module when you're dealing with promises because they're so composable. Uh, it still has, in my opinion though, the callback leakage issue. The callback is gone, but the promise abstraction is there. And it's not a bad thing actually, it's just when we're dealing with serial tasks and you'll see later on, I think there's a simpler way sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. The promise abstraction is actually a fantastic um, way of modeling problems so for, for, certain, for certain use cases as well. Um, it's, it's uh, and again, I think it's great for refactorability actually, but I want to uh, warn you that, you know, and, and there's some good articles online discussing this, that modules and node follow a typical convention. So it's great for refactoring, probably within your own projects, probably within your own modules, but it's probably not a good idea let, to build an API on top of something like this. Um, if you're looking for widespread adoption, um, it's probably good to, or if not, provide uh, some type of API that supports this and the callback pattern. Might be the better way. Uh, it has Ability to control parallelism. You can see up here in that step where I'm uh, doing two tests in parallel, I create an array and just return it, array of promises. Um, I actually use that to hack in and pass on the order information to the next step. You can create a, prom a promise off of just a, pretty much anything. And if it's hard, if it's, if it's not an actual like uh, deferred promise, then it will just be immediately resolved. Um, you can control parallelism. It's going to depend on the library too, as far as if it would, if you have like a, a list of tasks or actions complete. I don't know what all the library support is like for this, but if anything, you can always partition a set of promises and, and wait on the first ones come uh, start, and then wait on those, and then do the next partition. So they are composable in that fashion. And you know, again, it's the same thing as the async module. You can do take individual tasks that aren't all the same and you can stuff them into an array or you can uh, break them up into steps as you need to. Um, problem is it still has the same conundrum with shared variable scope. Uh, at least in the example I've given, perhaps maybe you can arrange things somehow to avoid that problem. Um, you have to deal with it somehow though, passing stuff forward more or less. So the next, any questions? I'm rolling through this pretty quick. Anybody have any questions? Maybe this talk will actually go under and not over. <laughs> the next thing I looked at in the impetus for this talk was Ice Coffee Script and Tame.js. So we saw the promises last time. We thought, well, let's look at this this way. Um, I got really excited when I saw this. Uh, I hadn't at the time used the C sharp uh, await defer type syntax. I think it's just async and await actually. Um, so I hadn't actually seen that solution, but I knew it was coming down the pipe, and I was pretty excited about that. And I thought, well, cool, someone's gone out and changed the language now. So instead of building a package or some type of framework to resolve this problem, people have come about it and said, let's change the language instead. Uh, so Ice Coffee Script and TameJS produced by, I think, OkCupid. Uh, it's out there free. You can go get it, go look at it. Uh, it's not much but a super set of CoffeeScript and JavaScript that compiles down to CoffeeScript and JavaScript. So, and maybe it just bypasses CoffeeScript when you use ice, I don't know. Anyway, so you can compile this out. And I'll actually, let's actually look at that. Um, so let's turn the screen. 
So these come with, and you can install these in your global scope, uh, little uh, <laughs> command line interfaces basically compile stuff down. The nice thing is all of these tools and even the language compilations I'm using are like CoffeeScript. You can just put a require in your uh, maybe your main application file and it will just deal with uh, you know, doing a compilation for you in a lot of cases. So you don't have to, don't have to do a lot of work to get this stuff to But you can also compile it if you want to see what it looks like because it ain't pretty. So. so you can compile it out. Okay, so it kind of compiles it out, and if you look at it, you're going to start to see, though there's a lot of code here, it starts to march off the screen. So what, uh, what, what these language level solutions are doing is they're actually taking and creating a way that you can express things in a new way, and it will transform them into basically the uh, pyramid of doom for you. It's a, referred to as a CPS transform, continuation passive style transform. And they all vary in how they work and what they do and their capabilities. But at the end of the day, they kind of take the ugly way of doing it and they compile to that so you don't have to do that. So it's a super set. It's kind of cool. So I got excited about this, and let's look at it. And, uh, I broke things out similar, tried to group things so you can see the same steps. But the first thing you should notice is there's really no functions here, and that may or may or may not be a good thing, especially if some of these blocks start getting confusing, but I like it because when you're inside of maybe a controller action and you're doing this where you're grabbing three things and you're sending an email, you don't really need a bunch of functions to do that um, until maybe it grows out of control. Or when you're in a service layer or wherever, maybe you're integrating something somewhere. So we connect to the database just like before. The difference is to, uh, to pull this off or basically how I work is you put this await keyword in front of an asynchronous call, and in place of the callback, you put this defer method and you name the variables that are going to come back to uh, come back upon completion. So the typical callback pattern is an error, and in this case, we're turning the database object. So that's what basically uh, that's what, sorry that's what comes back. And then once it's complete, it'll be like these variables magically exist in the scope. And they're just doing that by, again, we're transforming. If you looked in that code, you would see them basically being part of an outer closure and available inside the inner closure thing. So that's all that really does. Um, does that make sense to everybody? It's a very simple explanation of the problem. <laughs> so by using this, uh, well, the first thing that kind of frustrated me, though, is I like an IDE that tells me when I do things wrong, you know, a JavaScript, tells me when I do the simple, stupid things wrong. <laughs> and uh, of course, these are not. Uh, this doesn't. This is not valid JavaScript. So, even though I'm using JavaScript, or actually CoffeeScript in this case, uh, WebStorm I use is upset at me because it thinks there's broken stuff. But so I kind of have to like probably turn the errors off in these files, which I guess that's a drawback actually. But um, the next solution I show you won't have that problem. So uh, the let's do this. Let's break this in half. So you know, just go through the steps here. Uh, maybe I want to point out actually before I break it in half that when we're running a set of parallel tasks here, um, you can just nest them inside of an array keyword and do the same to first scenario and run two things in parallel. So pretty nice. Um, the only problem I had was, I think it was like, you solved one of my big problems and that's that shared variable scope and making the code readable. But then you didn't do anything about errors. So you still have to deal with errors yourself. All it does is return them for you. And you can see in the case of a parallel situation, you actually have two different errors coming back. Uh, so you kind of still have to deal with errors. You still have that ceremony and copy and paste. But I guess it's half of the solution. Um, I'm very thankful I didn't have to rely on this and someone has taken it the next step. Uh, okay, so it's more readable in my opinion, except for the error handling. So that's a good thing. And it's refactorable in my opinion, especially because it's easier to read and understand. But again, this is one of those things like with promises where it wouldn't be a good idea to use this at a module boundary. It wouldn't be a good idea to probably build a package with this as your part of your API. 
uh, you want to just, and, and it works great with the callback style, so you'd want to leave callbacks as an integration mechanism with other modules and applications, but uh, within, you can do whatever, and you can move things around, it's really nice, actually, and you don't have the, you don't have the problem of global scope with very, or like pseudo global scope with variables and having to worry about making sure you move your declarations and things like that if you move a chunk of code. It's kind of like I can select this chunk of code and know it's all related here. And when I move it, yeah, there are variables coming in, but I can go find those and pass those. Um, matter of fact, my refactoring tools will work really well with this at some point. Um, it allows for parallelism, fantastic. Uh, it doesn't really have any way to control that though. Uh, aside from the same mechanisms we talked about with async and with promises, and you can do partitioning. Um, and but you do with individual ta tasks, it's really easy. You don't have to create like a separate function and make a new step in the process. You can just break those lines of code and nest them in separate awaits. So it's a pretty quick way to do that. A little better, in my opinion, I guess. And yeah, we have the shared variable scope. So awesome. Questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. What happens when the pro program counter hits a defer more than once? Like if it's in a loop or something? Sure. Um, you actually can run, and I don't have the syntax available here, you can run, uh, you can nest these inside of a loop. Depending on how you nest it inside of the loop will be, will dictate if it runs in serial, like one at a time, or if it will run them all at the same time. So, yeah. Kind of depends on whether you want them to run in parallel or series one at a time. So. So not a lot of control over that concurrency at all. So what's the continuation there? Is it anything after the await? Yes, exactly. And uh, it's crazy. I haven't even looked into how it's implemented because that's one of those cases where it gets nasty. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, kind of look, and that, and that brings a good point. If you want to, like, kind of in your mind, think about how it's going to nest things. It's like everything after an await is like a nested function. It takes care of that for you. So should also remind you that, like, if you go off and do this type of activity that you're not going to just like return at the end of all this, this is a chain that's being executed. Um, and it's at, at a module boundary like this, if, if you had a callback being passed in up here, you'd have to call that callback at some point if you wanted to uh, let the original caller know that you're complete. It's not going to be like a synchronous return over all of that module. So it's only within that you kind of have that uh, shared scope, if you will. It's just marching off the screen for you. So you don't have to deal with that. Yeah, go ahead. So it looks just like copy script. Is this, is it a concise copy script? An actual fork of copy script? Is it yes. a superset of it? Yeah, it's a superset, yeah. They just add a few keywords and they come. I don't, I think they compile to copy script and then maybe to JavaScript, but I could be wrong. They could actually just compile straight to JavaScript just using the copy script um, fork. That's probably actually what they do. So, okay. yeah. yeah, and they have tame JS. And TameJS, and I will let's actually show that. I did actually make that one too. I won't walk through it so much, but there is a JavaScript dish version of this. Looks very similar, except we now have our verbosity in the back. Is I go get the user's the user information, the tracking information, and to pull this off and run those in parallel, if you uh, if you create if you basically basically just like when pulling an order, I put the placeholder in, but I wrap it in a closure, and I, I don't actually um, pass the uh, the underscore character to it. It's like it does a bind, but it doesn't call it yet. So. Sorry, it's kind of like bind and it's kind of like the difference between bind and call, where it doesn't actually call it, but it does. It calls it, starts it all up, but it doesn't wait on it. So that's what it does. It actually returns a promise or something like a promise, a future. They call it a future. It's going to be a lot like a promise. It's kind of like a task of task abstraction that you can wait on later. So I do that. I wrap it in a closure, which this is kind of booted to me. Um, it is what it is, and then you wait on it later. You, when you get into these scenarios of parallelism, there's almost no way to hide that parallelism from your code. There's just going to be a way that you prefer, possibly, or maybe an abstraction that um, solves your particular problem a little better. So in this case, we introduce tasks, more or less. And if anybody's seen the C Sharp 5 implementation, this is exactly the same way. Asynchronous methods return a task or a prompt. It's the same thing as a promise. It's going to have either whether or not it succeeded or failed or is running, 
um, or basically not completed, and uh, the returned object or an error if it has. So I actually go ahead and fork off two little tasks to run to get this information, and then I, um, by passing in the underscore character, basically the callback, by passing the callback now and not passing a null a no object for that more or less, then it goes ahead and waits at this point for most to complete. So I do that with both of those two tasks, and then bam, I got the information there. And again, but it's like I just like return the information here. So whatever these two variables, even though they're futures, I have the information I want at that point. And then lastly, I send the message again. I don't, um, I don't, I'm not getting anything back, so I don't need to uh, capture anything. But I can just use the placeholder to fire off that asynchronous method and wait for it to complete before I go on. And then the lovely thing about all of this is, like the C# -sharp implementation, this implementation goes ahead and does voodoo with with errors and actually will re-throw them within this, what looks like a serial scope, uh, so that you can use try-catches. Which, in, um, you know, oh, I don't know in the JavaScript world, it may be really contentious to say it, but I think they're a wonderful way to express your error handling in a, in a, a chunk of serial code like this. And you can move that try-and-catch around wherever you want, and easily close a scope, and uh, a lot like with promises, it's highly composable error handling. I like it, so. And then the nice thing, I can have a finally close my database connection if there's a problem, so. All right. And, he and here's a JavaScript version, um, just more verbose again. It looks a lot like you have your placeholder, and you just look like you're getting variables back. Questions? Are you including a module, or is there a Yeah, absolutely. Um, to get this to run, uh, in the case of the ICE CoffeeScript and TAMJS, you just include, uh, like perhaps if you have like an Express app and you want to include it, or just a console app, just whatever starts up your app, just put this in there and load the module. Before you load the module that is of this type, and you won't have to worry about compilation. Otherwise, your other choice is to have a part of your build step to do the compilation. So, yeah, on the fly or, or build. And if you go look at the, the sites, usually they're pretty good about documenting all the different ways. As a matter of fact, Streamline is this guy is like put a lot of time into the uh, documentation on GitHub. And you can, he shows you how to use it in the browser, has modules to help you with that, how to use it server side, has explanation of all of that. So. Now, and then, yeah, on the Streamline side, um, again, just put this in your. Uh, main module and it will load this module and you have some options too. And it can work with fibers if anybody's heard of fibers. There's a, instead of compiling a JavaScript, it will compile down to a fiber, or it will, uh, actually I've never used this, I shouldn't say, but it does something to use fibers instead of compiling down. But I program on Windows and fibers can be trouble on Windows, so <laughs> I, don't, I haven't used those yet. All right. Which I know, you know, contentious with a lot of people in the audience. So, yeah, so great error handling. It's readable. It's readable. You can see what's going on here. This is the example, like I said at the beginning of the talk. Every time I go back to try and understand what exactly my scenario was, I start looking at the nested one. I'm like, ah, what am I doing? I made this great. I go back to this one and I can really remember what I'm doing when I go back and just look at this real quickly and glance at it and know what I'm doing. Um, it, it's refactorable, but again, it's not probably a good idea to build this into your module boundaries. Because it's just, you know, the community is set around the callbacks and that's cool. There's nothing really wrong with that. I think it works great. And uh, just use this within your, your little world to make your life better. Uh, it has ability to do uh, parallel operations, obviously, with the task feature promise abstraction. And uh, as far as controlling the actual iteration parallelism, the features you can do that with by, by partitioning, kind of we talked about before. But more importantly, there is actually a module that he's included called flows for doing that type of limiting, like map limit and async. So you actually can control some of that. I guess he kind of looks at it. It's like a funnel. I saw it was in the abstraction. It's a kind of cool way of looking at like all these tasks are coming into a funnel and only something can come out at a time. So. Oops. Um, and as far as individual tasks, again, you have features abstraction, so uh, 
you can, you can, and, and unlike the promises where I kind of deemed this, uh, because you don't have to really like make another function to run a separate set of those tasks together, you can just have, uh, you can just wait at the appropriate times. As you can see, in the user tasks and the tracking tasks, if I wanted to wait for the tracking later on, I could have put that in a subsequent call. So if I had four of those running, I could wait for two of them, and then I could wait for the other two without having to break out a bunch of code. Uh, and yeah, sure, very good. So it makes me happy. So I really feel like the three biggest criteria in my mind were the error handling, you know, not having to copy and paste all the time, getting keeping the shared variable scope like we have with uh, Pyramid of Doom, and readability slash refactorability. Those are the biggest things in my mind. I introduced some parallel parts of this just because I think those are the next concerns, and some of these libraries do a really nice job of addressing those. Any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. With the shared variable scope, wouldn't you rather be explicit about the things you're passing into the continuation <clears throat> rather than having it just all lexically scoped? Right. Um, you know, I feel like it's, you know, it may, may, maybe your, maybe one person's, sorry, not yours, but maybe any one person's opinion on how they want that to flow. Um, I f in, in the use case where I'm using this app, like the recommendation for for, and, and how I've actually used it in reality is to keep it within a very narrow scope of a set of tasks that I'm just doing to compose an object and send it somewhere. And so in, I'm not really going to break that out into a bunch of separate parts and reuse it or anything. So the explicitness isn't so important to me um, as far as like a maybe, maybe like one big object I'm building up. I don't know if that's maybe what you're asking. but. I know some of the libraries actually do have like this notion of a data object that you can flow through your flow and you can attach things to it and be real kind of explicit about that everything gets attached to that. I don't like that because then it really is not refactorable at that point because you've got to then break that data object apart. Um, and, and in the scope of these particular scenarios, uh, the reason I like this so much is I'm getting my order object. I'm passing it to these two steps. If I had, and, and watch for the language support for it because then the tooling will come around it. But if I had tooling around this particular abstraction of, of uh, coffee script, okay, superset, sorry, um, then I could, uh, you know, web source is fantastic for refactoring. I could grab these two lines of code. You know, it's not going to work now, but I could control RM, yank out a method, and put it somewhere else. And it's going to take care of passing those parameters. And then, yeah, first thing I'm going to see is probably like, oh, God, I've passed like four things. Let's make an object for it. So you still could actually build up an object if you desired it. You know, you could make your own data object and um, initialize it here and then start tacking everything on if you want to be explicit. It's kind of, the nice thing is this way allows you to go either way, perhaps. Okay, so back calls, I just wanted to point it out because it may happen, but then it kind of fizzled. It was like this like day or a couple of days of activity on GitHub on this one issue, and then it just kind of went, this and just stopped. So maybe it won't happen, but I threw together my understanding of, and actually where I just kind of yanked out of the comments what I thought it would, people were talking about for the majority, because everybody was like, let's do it this way, let's do it this way, let's do it this way. I tried to get the gist of it and maybe how it looked a little bit like in the examples I've given. So I could have interpreted this completely wrong, but um, with back calls, uh, it'd be a lot like the assignment we just saw where you could execute an asynchronous function. It would assume, or maybe some people actually ask for that placeholder a lot like we saw in streamline the underscore or something like it, a placeholder to denote where the callback's at in case it's not at the end. Um, whatever, it may or may, that, so that may or may not be there, it may assume it or it may put it at the, you may be able to put it, have to physically place it every time. Uh, and then you basically just get your variables back. So it's kind of like the streamlined implementation of ours. The only thing I didn't really see, and so I didn't want to assume it, was nobody was really talking about error handling. I don't think that's, for some reason, a concern for people. I think they must like copy and pasting those. Um, or maybe it's not the primary concern. So. I don't know what that would look like. Again, this is just proposed. I think this might, might be what people were talking about. Um, and also, there wasn't a lot of chatter about like running tests in parallel, so I didn't want to assume anything about what people were trying to say um, with regard to running multiple. But I'm sure that would somehow fit in all of this. Maybe it look like uh, the await scenario where you, in, uh, back in the await uh, from ice coffee script, you would have more of a nested type back call set up. I don't know. So. 
or, or may not be relevant at all. And perhaps it's maybe because of all of these issues and some people want to address all of them, like Streamline, I think, did. And like I kind of have the opinion of some people maybe only want to address some of them. And I think that's why it's really hard to get traction as far as uh, frameworks and um, especially language level support for something like this. So, so yeah, I, I analyze it. I'm going to give, ding it for error handling. It's readable. Um, it's refactorable. It's, uh, it's language support at this point. So it's, of course, refactorable. And hopefully the tooling would just follow right after. Um, nothing really proposed for parallelism. Uh, and of course, it, yeah, the main thing that's really addressing is, is uh, one scope for variables. So, or what seems to be one scope. For you don't have to make it explicit. Um, yeah, any questions or comments? Did anybody else read the back call thread on GitHub? OK. I was excited for a day there. I think Sean, you pointed it out to me. I was like, oh my god. So, Because I, I think I remember originally reading that there people were like, no, we're not going to ever do something like that. So after the OK Cupid thing came out. So. It's happening. Is it? It's definitely. Are they doing it? OK, cool. So, are you involved in it or? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm the one that proposed it. OK. All right. I didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Damn it. I researched my audience. They were trying to cross-reference, and I guess I missed that one. So I should have gone back to that one. Oh, so that was your thread. So you would obviously do it. Anyway. I feel horrible. Well, maybe I've given you some ideas. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, maybe I've just horribly offended you. Uh, OK. My recommendations at this point. Uh, and take them or leave them because it take them how you want. But uh, use them at module boundaries. And I think it's Michael, just pronounced Michael, that spelled really interestingly. I had a nice post maybe 10 days ago or so. There was kind of like a little in this community again, this discussion of this. And anyway, he uh, did a pretty good job of pointing out node success has been built on simplicity and consistency. And uh, it was in response to somebody saying that promises were a missed opportunity for node. And uh, both articles are absolutely fantastic and give absolutely great perspectives on both sides of, of the debate about how to, how to introduce something like this. And I really feel like his article is just you know, reiterating that the community is built around callbacks as the pattern. So let's keep that. And if you want more, you know, look at a framework or maybe look at a language level solution, um, then nothing is going to come and note itself. And it's probably an appropriate answer to the problem. So. Uh, you know, the solutions I've shown today, my recommendation is use this within your own modules. So if you have like a controller that has a bunch of actions on it, it's, it's a lot of times it's great to coordinate resources to build a response. It's a great place for it. Uh, maybe if you have your little module that you're building, um, you can keep it all within and then com compile down the JavaScript at the end of the day instead of a big deal. Um, I mean, be aware that some of these solutions compile to some pretty ugly JavaScript, but uh, I guess I'm at the opinion that if you've got a module and it's tested well, it doesn't really matter what it compiles to as long as it works and it performs and sufficient to your needs. So um, make your own criteria. I've given some criteria here. These are the things I thought were important. Add to it, remove from it, modify your analysis of. So and watch for language level support because I think. In about maybe 10 years when IE will catch up, we could look at things like this being a part of JavaScript or closer to abstractions like the, this being part of JavaScript. Most notably, the yield keyword, I think, is one thing we can look forward to. So, it should give you some of the way towards this. I kinda, and I kind of see that as a long evolution because Microsoft introduced, and I, yes, I'm a Microsoft person sometimes, and they introduced the yield keyword a long time ago, and a lot of languages have already had it. And then the next thing they introduced, by having the yield keyword is these types of abstractions can be built on top of it really easily. So um, that's what they did in C Sharp 5 then, maybe five years after they introduced the yield keyword to C Sharp. So um, I think that's it. Yeah, I ain't got nothing else unless people have questions. So do you have any criteria to add? Any things you're looking at? Me? Yeah. Any anything in maybe the by I guess it's sitting up here. My interpretation of what people are talking about in general, they might look different. Hit all the perspectives that are important right now. Good. Okay. 
Okay. Thought maybe there was some, something I completely missed. I'd love to know because then I could go. I'm glad you got to the back calls. What's that? I'm glad you got to the back calls. Yeah, yeah. I, this is just an assumption. Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you're implementing? That this would be implemented correctly. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And the, the placeholder syntax is, isn't necessary because you can instead pass just a function with some argument. They were calling it the hug operator. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you just pass pass it some function with an argument, put the argument wherever you want, and that right. would be the callback because that's the last thing of the actual function that's given to it. Yeah. Go read that because there's a lot of good ideas in there. So and then you can make the key little hug. <laughs> it's an extremely simple abstraction, and yeah. it's pretty powerful. All right. That's all I got. Thank you.